Good afternoon. My name is Jody Brockington, and I'd like to welcome you all to the National Urban League's Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series. Today we have an executive recruiter, a top expert here, to share with us his vision, views, and the facts on the do's and don'ts from a recruiter himself. This is our final Digital Career Success Series of our summer season, and we hope that today will bring everyone's questions, answers, and careers to a better place. Please find us on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube for Urban League Job Network. We'd like to thank Sodexo today as our, as our sponsor for today's Digital Career Success Series. And you can learn more about the great jobs and the career growth opportunities that they have and offer to all of us here at the National Urban League. They've supported us for quite some time and have definitely um, hired us in their company. Today, we bring to you the Digital Career Success Series, Do's and Don'ts from a Recruiter. And the recruiter we're bringing to you today is Marlon B. Cousin of the, Marlin, of the Markin Group. Excuse me. And the Markin Group, is a, he's the managing partner of the Markin Group, and they focus on the development of human capital, temporary staffing, executive search and coaching, workforce development, and online recruiting. Marlon, as most of the Digital Career Success Series guests and speakers, is also an infamous FOJ, a friend of Jody. We met years ago now at a Women of Power uh, Summit hosted by Black Enterprise. He was one of the only men there um, on my girlfriend's panel who I came to support. And he impressed me by the presentation they did on how to use social media for your career. The rest is history. And now he is here to join us this afternoon and share with you the do's and don'ts of an executive recruiter. Marlon? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this series. I think this series is perfect timing simple because I think that as we get prepared for this season of career fairs, I think it's going to be critically important to uh, make sure that you know we are prepared the right way. Not only that, I think this is sort of the downtime for companies to be hiring, but I think once we get into the October, September time frame, companies will get geared up again. And not only that, the season of career fairs, like the National Urban League at the end of the month, and National Black NBA in September, as well as the National uh, Nishimba that's in October, and the local career fairs that you're going to have as well. So if Dawn can put up the presentation, the deck would be great. Uh, we can get jump right in and get started. So in understanding Marlon, that. Marlon, Marlon, yeah. Marlon, you have controls. We're looking at your uh, blue screen. Okay, I can't. Just have to take control. Okay. I don't have it here. So, uh, and and if you go to Chrome and Prezi. Got it? We, I, I, have, I have your presentation on, on our screen. If, uh, once you have it on yours, we'll, we'll take back control. I mean, we'll give you back control. So in the interim, while this is being set up, what Marlon was alluding to is the idea that this is career fair season, starting from the summertime until early fall, um, is when most recruiters and organizations are hosting a variety of career fairs, job opportunities, job fairs. Even if those of you on the phone might be entrepreneurs, this is the time where programs are being offered 
and to really take advantage. And what Arlen will bring to us today is really from a viewpoint from an executive recruiter um, and what they look for and who they're looking for and what they look at on your resume, you yourself as a person, how you present yourself um, at a career fair. And being prepared mm -hmm. is key of getting an opportunity um, or not. So are we ready to roll? Two seconds, I think. I'm seeing you, Dawn. OK. So, and also just if you guys have some questions, you can start sending those in now, too, via the chat and the question box on your screen. Marlon, if uh, mm -hmm. you take control, we uh, we can go. What do you see on my screen? Do you see it on my screen? No. No. So, you know what? It's okay. We can move forward with um with what mm -hmm. we have um because okay. I, I have your presentation. Just say you know mm -hmm. move next slide if you need okay. one. You're good. Ready. Right. Yeah. So we'll just go to the first slide. Thanks. Okay. Good. So a part of what I want to do today is give you one man's perspective. One is what I experience every day uh, in dealing with candidates every day as well as with clients, prospective clients, and what they can tell you. So I'm not going to tell you what I've heard. I'm going to share with you what I know and what we experience every day. So the first thing, very quickly, is I think that everyone should have a strategic approach on how you plan, prepare, and practice this process. Because I think a lot of times what we find in many cases that Candidates, in many cases, are unprepared. And so having a strategy around how you want to approach this process, I think, is critically important. So one of the things we're going to talk about as we kind of go through this is the critical steps to do that. And one is self-assessment and, and that whole looking at yourself as well as resume development, uh, presentation effectiveness, networking plan, as well as how to close a deal. Because at the end of the day, we want to either find our dream job or be doing our genius, which is critically important. So when we talk about self-assessment, I think it's critically important that we understand that it is not a recruiter's responsibility or a potential employer's responsibility to know what your career goals are. Uh, you need to be clear about what they are. You need to be focused around uh, what those things are and design a plan around what you're trying to get accomplished. I can't tell you how many times we talk to people every day, 50 people a day, and they are very unclear about what they want to do. So here's the reality. I can't help you what you want to do if you don't know what you want to do. So we spend the time doing this whole career coaching thing. And it's, again, it's not our responsibility to be your career coach. It's really your responsibility to do the research and understand what you want to do. And then at the end of the day, we're not an emotional counselor for you as well. So uh, it's a lot of emotion that goes in, in particular when you talk about the transition from one job to another, uh, a bad situation, a cultural situation that's not good, good. So let's be clear about what you want to do. So in shifting that, I think it's critically important to have that brand. And that brand is your resume. And I know we've had a series talking about resumes, but uh, just to give you a quick perspective about resumes, and we evaluate your resume within 10 to 15 seconds. And your resume is your billboard. And your billboard should represent your skills and experience at a very high level. And at the end of the day, you got to think about it. Do I have a resume that a company wants to buy? So to give you an example, if, you, if you're driving down the road and you see a, uh, a Burger King or a McDonald's or even a Coca-Cola billboard, uh, the whole purpose of that billboard is to give someone that emotional incentive to buy. And so when someone looks at your resume, the whole idea is that they have that emotional connection with you, that they want to buy that product. And they want to buy you as a person they want to bring into the organization. So it's critically important to have that brand and have that resume right. Now, we're not going to go into a lot of details, but I'll sort of summarize. Obviously, you know, I'm a big proponent that you should write your own resume because at the end of the day, you have to be the one to sell it. Uh, I know we all have resume writing coaches. We, we actually offer that service, but a part of it is I think you need to be enthralled in the process. I think it's such a critical part of, of selling it if you've actually done the work and it's well-written and well-structured. 
But not only that, think about you know, how you want your resume to be competitive in the marketplace, i.e. use terminology to, that are more recent, more relevant, like healthcare analytics or SAP. So make sure that you have some level of relevancy in what the competitive landscape is as, as of today. And then how we as executive recruiter or potential employees interpret that is, is very, very important as well. So when you look at you know, the things that we are looking for in a resume, we talk about relevant experience. Again, this is, you know, we talk to candidates, well, I can do this. We, we all read that book, Who Moved My Cheese. I believe that if I just get in there, I, I can do a great job. I can convince them that I can do this job, although I've never done it. So at the end of the day, if, if you want to be a rocket scientist and you've never been up in a rocket, they're not going to hire you. Uh, recently, they want relevant experience. They want you know recent relevant experience as well. Now, is that good or bad? But that's what they want. Scope of responsibility. Uh, we do a very poor job of, in our resume because we don't take the quality time to really go into, particularly when we talk about 10 years ago, putting the relevant experience on our resume and put that scope of responsibility, spending that quality time. And to help you with that, just go to Google. And if you're a sales manager, put in sales manager job description and it'll give you a, you know, a lot of different job descriptions you can pull from to develop that in, in your the content into your resume. Make sure you have whether you coach and train develop people, how many people you manage, what that P&L look like. We want to know whether you called on key customers, i.e. whether it's a Walmart or Sodesco, whatever. We want to know you've done that. As well as we talked about accomplishments. Don't be, you know, don't embellish, but don't be afraid to talk about what you've done because if you're competing against a Jody, she's going to tell you what she's done in her resume. So let's make sure we capture that accordingly. The other thing is, is that we want to make sure that the things that are in resume that are relevant give you some really, really good points to sort of think about in the development and what we see when we see that piece of branding that you're putting together. So when you talk about address, we think that for granted. But now, particularly if you talk about local markets and we talk about traffic flow, uh, I'm a big proponent of putting the address on there, although I think you hear some you know, different ideas of saying don't put it on there, et cetera. But in many cases, if you look at a city like New York or Atlanta where traffic is very horrendous, well, you know, they're human. So they're thinking in their mind, well, you live in X and that's 30 miles away. Can you get to the job? At the end of the day, it's your responsibility. They don't know your family dynamics, but they are human. So they're thinking about that when they're making hiring decisions. And then the phone number, you know, you'd be surprised. Again, I'm not telling you what I've heard, I'm telling you what I know. Is give me a phone number that you can be reached. In many cases we have worked during the day and I have people still put their home number on there. So I can't reach you. So put a number that I can reach you. So understanding that concept, when I do call you, if I don't hear hear any energy or, you know, hello, this is Marlon. Uh, please give me a call back. I'm probably not going to call you back. We're looking for people who are going to be leaders in our organization. Hey, this is Marlon. Have a fantastic day. Those are the people that we want to talk to. Now, some of you are saying, well, Marlon, I really don't have my voice on. I use just a generic one. So one of the things we've just been talking about is about branding. So think about this for a minute. Here's a great opportunity for you to brand yourself with your voice and your excitement, your leadership, just through your voicemail and you don't give us an opportunity to do that, or you don't give yourself an opportunity to do that. This is a branding opportunity, and you hear Jody talk a lot about branding, how important branding is, and this is a branding opportunity, you lose that because you use a generic voicemail. So one of the things I recommend is use your voice and talk about, give them that positive energy, because I leave that with, wow, I want to talk to this person. Same thing with the email address. Now, I don't need to know, you know, sexymama at gmail.com. Now, again, I'm telling you what I see every day. You, not, you may not believe it, but I see this done every day. Here's another opportunity for you to brand yourself, whether it's marlon.cousin at markwin.com or whatever it is. This is a great opportunity for you to do so. Why not take advantage of it? And then we talked about objective or executive summary, as you would say. Um, spend some good quality time because that's at the top of your resume. That's what I call your opening statement. And spend some good quality time with your opening statement because that executive summary objectives really validates or tell a reader or potential employer what you're going to read in the body of my resume and what it's going to entail. So you're giving a sneak peek under the cover what you're going to see. Also, left to right. And I said read left to right. In many cases, put your powerful words on the left side of your resume. You know, studies show that you know people remember 60% more on the, what's on the left side versus on the right side. So make sure you do that. 
And then reference check. I know a lot of you, they ask for three references. Uh, one of the things I would recommend is, and I know it's a very awkward situation, but to interview the people you've put as references. Um, you know, we, I can give you example after example is that you put a reference down, but they, they don't understand. I'm calling them as an experienced and an expert recruiter. I'm going to ask them questions that they're not prepared for. And so with that in mind, spend some time, say, listen, you know, uh, you know, Marlon, I put you down as a reference. If you don't mind, I would love to interview you just to get a sense of what you would say about me. Because if they don't say anything that's overwhelming from an HR perspective, that is uh, a signal, a sign that says, mm, I don't know if I would hire them again. Again, you want them to say overwhelming things for, about you. And then talk about salary. So quickly about salary, please have a clear understanding of what your floor and your ceilings are. Um, you know, and know what the market is given accordingly. So you know, know what the top range and the bottom range. And again, when you move from different geographical areas, be sensitive that what you make in New York can be totally different than what you're going to make in Nashville. What you make in San Francisco is going to be totally different than what you make in Texas because they don't have to take tax. So you know, be aware of what all those dynamics are when you talk about salary. Then background check. One of the things I encourage people to do, and, and we don't do enough of this, is check your own background. You know, I've had cases where something was in their background that they weren't aware of. For example, a clerk had um, typed in fired versus, you know, been laid off. That's completely different. So every time this person would interview for a job, it would show that they were fired, not laid off. So be sensitive to that. Again, there are ways you can go in and check your background and make sure you do that. I think that's critically important to this whole process. And just quickly to go through some of the do's and don'ts. Well, let's don't. I, I, I like two-page resumes. Uh, three page if you got 15 plus years, but again, uh, I like to keep it at two. Don't lie on your resume. Be careful about what you're saying. Don't speak in first person grammar. You know, colors or inconsistent font. Be 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 very clear and concise on what you're trying to put together. Also, be careful how you use bold. I, I'm not saying don't use bold or italicis, but just make sure that when you use bold, it's really to draw that reader's eye to that what you want to come out. Whether it's I have experience in SAP or what something that's special uh, stands out in your resume you want their eyes to be drawn to. Uh, you'd be surprised. Some people will use a text language. Uh, and be careful around industry jargon, particularly if you're coming from the healthcare field and you're shifting, going into another field. Just be careful about using that type of terminology because those are things that you relate to, but they may not. Understanding that branding, that piece, be careful about what you give. I mean, again, we talk about age, we talk about religion. You have to decide what you want to be out there and what you want a potential employer to know. That, that's up to you. That's, that's an individual decision for you to make. I always err on the side of, I'm going to give you as much information you need for me to do this job. So be sensitive about what you give out. Um, don't include references and, and salaries on the resume. You'll be surprised people still do that. Um, don't list hobbies unless it's relevant to a job. Like my dream job is to be a PGA professional. So obviously I would put that on my resume if it's relevant to a job that I'm applying for in that, in that space. And then try not to be negative if, if you don't mind. Also, let's try to stay away from dates. You know, right now, as you know, we don't put dates and, and months around uh, on our resume as far as when we were at different places or education, et cetera. So again, we only want to go back 15 years, but again, we typically look a lot better than what our age would indicate. So when in doubt, just at the end of the day, just leave it out. Um, understand this as well. As we transition uh, from resume, now we're in this what I call interview or presentation effectiveness set setting. So when does an interview start? In many cases, when I make that phone call and I listen to your voicemail, the clock stops ticking. So again, as I mentioned to you before, if you don't have any passion or energy in that voice, I'm not calling you back. In many cases, an employee is not calling you back. And again, I love music just like everybody else. You know, I love studying different words of the Bible, et cetera. But again, understanding that the more you put out there, the more they have to evaluate. The type of genre of music you lead, you got to think about it. You may not be interviewing with that person that has the same likes that you have. So be, be sensitive to that. So it begins at that point. So be, when, you, when you think about these things, think about the culture that you go into. Culture right now is so critically important. I'll tell you that most people don't fail because they are incompetent. They fail because they choose the wrong employer. They choose it's just a wrong, wrong fit. So understand that fit is so critically important. So do the work, do the research, understand how they're, they're structured and how they're organized. Understand how your value, how your market value fits into that. So understanding that there's a reality and myth to all of this. 
so when you talk about what this process is really about, so we're sitting there, you're sitting there thinking, like, what, really, they, they really want me to join the company. No, they're really trying to narrow it down. So they're trying to eliminate the crap so they can get to the people they really want to talk to. So there's a decision tree starts in second and to eliminate the people they really, they really want to narrow this down to three of who they really want to talk to. And what you find is a lot of you have gone through this process. You always find a few people that really don't have time. You feel rushed in the process. And so you got to think about it. Uh, they don't really know what they want. Uh, they know who they want, but they don't know what they want. So I'll tell you from an honest perspective, they interview several people to try to figure out what they want. Because they'll come back to me and say, Marlon, you know, I talked to John. You know, I'd like to have that in the candidate as well. You'll be surprised how often that happens. So be careful about that. Uh, we don't want you to find yourself in a situation where you're not making a match. So the last point is be very careful about this whole process is subjective. I wish I could say it's objective because there are many people that are going to have the same skill set that you have. At the end of the day, what I tell candidates, the last thing I tell them is that you want to be likable. You have to be likable. And people want to be around you. So you'll find out in many cases that I need to be liked. Because most interviewers, they're not good. They haven't been trained to do that. They haven't been trained to interview. They really feel rushed. they got meetings to attend. So they, in many cases, they're bad. So how do you change a bad situation in in that hour, because really in many cases you don't have, you only have an hour, so you have to maximize that hour to make sure that they engage with what I have to offer. So if you look at a panel of five, the people you may interview, two or three of them don't want to be there. They just put it on their calendar. So how do you bring them involved and make sure that they embrace what you have to sell? The other thing is that even when you're there, I, I, I'm a big proponent of fit, and fit is so critically important. So when you're there, just don't look around. I mean, have a trained eye around. Look at how the people are around. How are they upbeat? You know, are they are they heads down? Are they excited? Do they feel like they're collaborative? You can tell all just sitting in the lobby. You can tell a lot about a company, about how they greet you, their body language. All those things are indicators of who they really are. So in many cases, if you're with a company that's not a good fit, it's because you chose not to read the signs. And so even when you're in those panel situations, please look at what's on their board, what's on their walls. Do they have positive messaging on their wall? It's a clear indicator of who they are as an individual and do I want to work for them, and a clear indicator of who they are as an organization. Now, understand that when you're in these type of panel situations, et cetera, that in many cases there's always one economic buyer. And you have to decide very quickly who that economic buyer is. If you don't know that going into the situation, you have to make a quick assessment of what that's going to be once you're there. And when you interview with different people, make sure that everybody's different. So you know, you know the, the four quadrants, you've got to put them in an aggressive quadrant or even a passive quadrant. So if you're in a passive quadrant, you've got to make sure you lower your voice and speak very softly and very slowly. Because if you go with an A-type personality, then again, you, you step back in your seat a little bit. Because they're not, they, that makes them feel uncomfortable. Conversely, that if you have more of an aggressive, you want to stand up. You want to maybe stand up in certain situations. You definitely want to sit up in your seat. You want to move forward because that's what they like. So be be aware of those things when you're in those set, in those settings. Now, some of the big mistakes that people make that we see all the time, you'll be surprised. You, you think that we get most of the time that hey, you know, John didn't make the cut because John didn't have this skill set. John didn't articulate his thoughts and ideas very well. No. The, the, the main thing we hear the most is lack of passion and energy. And I know that surprised a lot of people, but we hear it so often. It, it just blows my mind uh, that we do that. So that's one thing we do from a coaching standpoint is to make sure that they understand that, again, you need to have passion and energy. So make sure we're not long-winded. Uh, dress is very critical. Now you, you find environments that are dressed down. So that doesn't mean flip-flops. And, and, again, I would say it doesn't mean open-toe shoes. But be aware of what that dress code is. And so we've had candidates get knocked out because they didn't understand just the dress code. Again, we don't need to get to the skills and experience because they didn't read the tea leaves the right way. So uh, we find that people can't articulate their thoughts and ideas very well. They read the wrong signals. They have poor listening skills. Uh, they're not asking the right questions. Don't go in asking what you know compensation is. You need to ask critical questions about the job, the role, the culture. Those are questions that they're looking for you to ask. The other things will take care of itself. Or sometimes we just have too many questions. Make sure that we shake our hands the right way. And, and don't embellish. It's okay to 
talk about our accomplishment. Be careful, there's a fine line between the two. Now, just to, some of these questions that I put on here are just stumbling questions. These are questions that they ask you just to get you to think. Most people stumble on them, et cetera. Not only just the tell me about yourself question, but also, you know, tell me about a time when, you know, you've been fired or you had to fire someone else. Uh, tell me about a time when you failed. Um, give me one developmental need that you're working on. These are things that are very difficult for people to ask. So, so let me give you an example. So if you're saying, give me one developmental need that you're working on, again, don't say, I don't have any. Uh, that's a sign of immaturity. You want to, you want, you know, most people that are hiring at different levels in the organization, they want to know that you understand what your developmental needs are and what you put in place to correct that. They want to know that you're growing. They want to know that you put things in place and mechanism in place so that you can grow. True leaders understand that and they respect that. So a lot of times, well, I don't have any developmental needs. And we want to say that all the time. Oh, I've never failed. Yeah, but if you have failed, in many cases, all of us have failed at one point in our careers, always put something early in your career, not late in your career. So you say, well, last week, you know, you know, I had to give a sales presentation and I bombed. No. You want to say, well, you know, I remember when I was an early sales rep, you talk about something that's early in your career. But not only that, you come back and talk about how you corrected that behavior, which I think is critically important. So these are a few questions that you kind of look at uh, with that in mind. And to help you to do that, go through this process, I, I believe in the STAR methodology, situation, strategy, tact tactics, and results. I think it's critically important. I'm not going to go through this, but I think you understand what they are. A lot of you have seen it. It helps you to be clear and concise. It helps you to talk about results. And some of the things that you want to do in, in preparing for STAR is, again, understand behavioral questions are going to be asked. Uh, under, you know, review them. And, and they can come from a lot of different directions, but spend the time to do that. Also, spend the time to find you know, balance between individuals. When you talk about team and your own individual accolades, when you talk about the STAR methodology, always talk about results. A lot of times we kind of go through this. And we talk about in a situation, we talk about a strategy we put in place, but we, we forget to talk about the results of what we put in place. So let's make sure we do that. We always, in many cases, uh, forget that. So understanding that, uh, image is so critically important. Uh, we, we discount that. Even if you're in a casual environment, it's about picking out the right wardrobe. Uh, it's about picking out the right material. So if you're not aware of what to do, obviously you can read Dress for Success books. But also, you know, talk to somebody in the organization and what is acceptable and what is not. I would tell you that companies say, well, just, Marlon, just come as you are. Whatever you want to work, they just come as you are. Well, you may come from a very, very casual environment. You may work in a plan environment and have to go into an office. You know, err on the side of conservative. Wear a suit anyway. Uh, but again, understand it. Wear a tie. If it's not required to have a, a coat, just make sure you wear a tie accordingly. And then this whole interviewing process around Skype. Let me tell you, is that you, I'm finding a lot of our clients, and you may have seen this in your own uh, processes, that they're using Skype a lot more than they have in the past. And that's very difficult. And so it's a very difficult and unusual process that we have to use in today's marketplace. So you've got to understand, if you put up your two hands, they're only seeing what's in that camera view. So they don't get the chance to see your hands. They don't get a chance to see your body language. So a part of that is you've got to learn how to, like an actor, how to use your face. And your face has to communicate in that box what you're trying to convey, excitement, energy, accomplishment, all those different things, where you're wondering, what you're thinking. And that's very difficult for some people to do. So you know, make sure that you practice. If you don't have Skype, get Skype because you've got to use Skype in order to uh, interview in the new world. So make sure you practice on them because it's very difficult. And even when you get online, make sure it works. You know, prepare, you know, 30 minutes before you have to do so. But also, make sure that you don't have any background or background noise that will enable you not to be heard and not to be felt. Or, or I, I'll tell you, we saw some inappropriate stuff in a Skype interview in the background. So I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling what I know, what has happened from that standpoint. So let's make sure that we make Skype as a part of our plan as well. Now, we talk about the, the end of this is really about closing the loop. I mean, this is simple stuff, but you'd be surprised at how many people don't do this. You know, closing that interview is about let me capture where my, my experience fit with what you need. Let me talk to you about how my experience and skills are good for your organization. Don't be afraid to ask for a card. They're going to say no in many cases, but then you figure it's important for you to ask. 
um, ask for the job. You'd be surprised. You know, I've had many cases where uh, a client will say, well, I didn't think they were interested in the job. You'd be surprised. Uh, I didn't think they were interested because you didn't ask for it. Uh, you need to make it very clear that I want this job and this is why I want this job. Now, we're going to send up a follow-up note. Email is appropriate. Uh, you don't have to send a personal note uh, because they're running, they're busy, and particularly, you know, again, they like that instant feedback. We live in an instantaneous type of environment, so we'll make sure we're consistent in doing that. And then we got to learn how to close the deal because at the end of the day, it's about a win-win for uh, us involved. So what I would say to you is be open and honest about everything. Uh, no matter what it is. Some of us got some things in our past. We may have been fired in our past. Uh, be open and honest about it. People will respect that. Uh, also, negotiate in good faith. Now, again, you know, you know, companies are saying, what are you making in the first interview in many cases? And, you know, when you say, well, you know, I like to be with, you know, I don't want to give that because I don't want to shoot myself in the foot because I... No, you know, they they got a budget they're trying to manage. So be say, listen, I like to make between seventy and eighty thousand dollars. Is that within your range? That's an appropriate response to that. So let's make sure we negotiate in good faith. So again, if you're making forty, again, they're not going to get you to eighty. And I'm just being realistic here. So that's a big jump for them. We'll talk a little bit about that. Prioritize your need. I mean, salary may not be the most important thing for you. It may be location. It may be, I don't want to work in an innovative industry. I want to work for Google, and that's one of the top companies in my list. I want to be in healthcare, so I want to be in healthcare analytics. That's important. Know your salary range. Again, know what that ceiling is and know what that floor is within your marketplace. Again, the biggest challenge that I see is people moving from Boston, New York, San Francisco, and moving to the south. And so that range changed. So let's make sure that we have a clear understanding of what that is, but also – Let's have a clear understanding of how that company pays. I mean, there's a philosophical approach in where they, make, where they need to be as far as what I call compressions or equity compression. So if you want 80 and the person that's doing the job is making 70, in many cases they run into what I call equity compression. So it's going to be hard for them to get that 80 for you. So you've got to decide what's important to you. So you're going to need to be flexible because at the end of the day, you've got, it has to be a win-win for both, a win-win for you as a talent that's coming to the organization and a win for them as well. So be careful that you don't hold uh, a company hostage. So for an example, you may find yourself in a situation where you have to take a job or you have to move back home and take care of an uh, elderly parent, or whatever those circumstances are. So you took a job that's below your market value, and it could be thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 below your market value because that's what's going on at the time. Well, in some cases, we try to hold a company hostage because we want them to make up that $30,000 gap or that $40,000 gap. And that's really unrealistic to ask them to do that. That's not that, their fault that you had to make that personal choice or that you had to find yourself in a different situation. So be very careful, and, and companies are cognizant of that. So be very careful about you know, you're not holding them hostage to get to your win-win. Okay? So let's talk about you know, going through this process of how important networking is. I, I'm a big proponent of social media, as I know Jody is, and, and how important social media is in this what I call job process or looking for a job process, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's – so let me be very clear. Employers and recruiters are looking at your social media platform. I do. Uh, I do all the time. So, And then you're saying to yourself, well, Marlon – all of my stuff is private, so you can't get to it. So you don't think that companies and myself play a ton of money to break through privacy, to get at the information that we want to get to. And so I'm a big proponent of that. So let's look at it from a strategic standpoint. So I use social media. It gives me an opportunity to look under the hood and look closely at what you really are, who you really are. So you got to have a strategy. So you know, I always say this, and I say this all the time. They hate when I say it. So you got to be careful about who you connect with on Facebook or other avenues. So all of us got Pookie. So we may not want to connect to Pookie, but Pookie is going to say some things on social media that I might see, and I think because you are associated with them, that that's who you are, and that's not who you are. So you got to have a strategic approach on how you even manage that social media platform, which I think is critically important. So I would suggest you what I'm looking for is I want to see that you're involved 
in the community. I want to see that you volunteer at your kid's school. I want to see that you're attending a networking event. I want These are the things I want to see because these are the people that I want in my organization. So one of the things we want to make sure in all of our social media platforms, we want to make sure the content is consistent. We want to make sure that we spend a little time updating them on a daily basis, if not on a weekly basis, on what we're doing, where we're going, what we're seeing. So let's make sure we have consistency throughout our whole platform. And then, you know, let's make sure that we focus on networking. And again, I said companies are viewing your social platform, so let's make sure that we give them something positive to look at. So uh, let's make sure we don't uh, lose sight of what they supposed are designed to do. So what, what defines success overall when we look at this whole process? One is we want to make sure that we have a clear overall strategy about how we approach this whole what I call job search, job change, uh, process and this strategy. Uh, make sure when I talk about touch points, at every touch point within this process with you, that a company, a particular employee, needs to have a positive experience. Email, social media, voicemail, everywhere they touch you, that they should have a positive experience with you. So let's make sure we correct this. So there are avenues in our whole platform that we say, you know, maybe that voicemail doesn't sound right, or maybe. We need to start to change those right quickly. Relationships with partners, and partners is, is with recruiters, et cetera. Again, don't begin a relationship with a recruiter or people you network with when you need a job. Always dial into your partner. Always let update them on what you're doing and things are changing in your life. Always keep them abreast of what you're going on because here's the thing. Even if you're on Facebook, why are you not telling people on Facebook that you're looking for a job? Why wouldn't you do that? You connected to 4,000 people and you don't communicate that. And so when you look at LinkedIn, why are you not joining these groups? I mean, back in the day, you couldn't join 50 groups and be involved in 50 groups on LinkedIn that didn't exist. So when you have these partnerships and you have these alignments, let's make sure we do that. And then stay connected. It's always critically important that we continue to stay connected, continue to stay involved, continue to be in our market dynamics. And so I think it's very important to this process. So if you follow these things, some of the things I'm trying to give you are kind of secrets. But things that my clients are saying about you are things that I think can help you go through this process. So as we get ready for this season, I think it's going to be a great season. The market is turning around tremendously. And when you talk about healthcare, we talk about innovation, we talk about uh, what I call defense, we talk about energy. These are industries that are doing extremely well. And then our traditional uh, CPG, et cetera, I think we're going to see a thrust of a lot of hiring coming in August and September. And I hope the information that I share with you today will help you get prepared to do so. So thank you guys for listening, and I'll take any questions at this point, Jody. Well, thank you, Marlon, and uh, also for the lovely comments that, yes, networking does matter, and your social media presence is clearly important. You have lots of questions today, and some I'm going to uh, have to condense a few into one, so they might be a little heavy answered. But um, you mentioned about the date. Everyone's concerned about what dates to delete, which ones to keep. Some people keep changing their resume every time. Um, so some ask for them, some don't. Um, and I err on the side of not having it, and if they really want to know when I graduated or a specific date of something, that it should come up in my interview. But I wanted to know your thoughts on that. Um, and I said maybe also based on when they're where, where they are in the workforce, the dates are more important. Exactly. Yeah. I think that we want to we, we want what we want to know is time frames where you've been in jobs. So we from a, from when you talk about experience, we want those dates, but we're only going back 15 years. We don't want dates in education and all those other things. Because uh, honestly, they will, you know they do want to decipher how old you are. Because let me ask you a question. Uh, have you ever seen a job description that's been put out there that say we're looking for 30 plus years of experience? You don't. 25 plus years of experience. You don't. So when I tell people I'm looking for someone with five to seven or two to three years of experience, and you got 15, you're like, I can do this job. They're only looking for two to three, but I have 15. But what we're really saying, the code word is, I'm really looking for someone younger. So that you understand that. So yeah, I know you have 15 years of experience in this industry, but I'm really looking for someone younger. So that's why I only want two to three years of experience. So that's why dates are important. Again, the important thing is to get what I call get the sit down. So you want to eliminate anything or everything that will not allow you to get the sit down. 
So that would be my advice. Well, I think that's fair. Um, when you, you talked about um, the stumbling questions or your presentation effectiveness, um, and you had talked about folks not being passionate enough or you know, what, what determines that? A lot of people said that they seem that they're, you know, passionate when they go in and answer questions. What, what's that really mean to a recruiter? Is it, you know, that you just... Yeah, I think, well, if you have it, that's a good thing. But you'd be surprised. People really focus on, you know, I really want to get out all my skills and experience. I want to talk to them about what I've done. And, and they just get so caught up into communicating that part of, their background that mm -hmm. they sort of lack the energy because at the end of the day the interview is a, is a story tell your story your, your story is about starts and stops your story is about inflections your story is about you know uh, elevations in and, and your voice and your your body language should do the exact same thing so if I'm sitting down in front of you and, and I talk about sunshine I almost draw a sun with my hand if I'm trying to lure you in, I bring you with my hands closer to what I'm saying. So all of that is about passion and energy. Not only that, even see, it's tough to do it when you're on the phone as well. So what I mm -hmm. encourage you to do is when you are doing a phone interview, and that's when we get it the most. Because what happens? We sit down when we do a phone interview. So stand up and, and you know, elongate your diaphragm so that way you sound a little different. You sound more convincing. You sound more what I call excited because now your diaphragm is elongated. It makes you speak better. So I encourage when you do phone interviews, stand up by giving them. You have cheat notes in front of you, so it's okay. And then when you sit in front of them, make sure you not only communicate with your voice, the passion energy. Use your face. Use your hands. Your body language should exude all of that because you're selling you. You're talking about your brand. So. Uh, make sure you do that. Your body language is critically important when you draw someone into your story. And they should be captivated by your story. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Mm. Well, this leads directly into a couple of questions that people had. They wanted you to kind of um, reframe and go back to the four panel personalities. Um, they said that most of them said they caught the aggressive and the passive and wanted to know what those other two behaviors are. So. So if you look at quadrant A, so if you draw a four box, so you got A, B, C, and D, and D being passive and A being aggressive, and, and B and C is a little bit in between. So there would be someone that has an A personality but don't like to be confronted, or C, someone that has more of a passive environment but looking for an aggressive individual. So you have to be able to read those quadrants quickly when you're interviewing with someone. Uh, and you can, you can assess that pretty quickly about how they shake your hand, how they greet you, how they look you in the eye, how close they interact with you when they first meet you. Uh, all of that are indicators uh, very, very quickly. So if someone, I've introduced someone and say, hey, Marlon, good morning. How are you doing? Good to meet you. It gives me a great indicator. So I, I sit back. I lower my vote. I'm having a great day. Now, if another person can, they shake my hand very firmly and say, hey, glad you're able to come. Good to meet you. I know what I'm dealing with. So make sure that when you're in one of those quadrants that you're able to adjust accordingly. It's so important to do that. Because I've had candidates that they only knew one quadrant. They only knew A, and, they, and they're A, and that's all they do. And so, you know, well, I, I felt like they may not be a good fit for the organization. Basically, you intimidated them or they didn't feel comfortable with you. That's what they're saying. So uh, just be able to read the signs. And, and there's, matter of fact, there's a book that's centered around how to read quadrants and that you can read that will be able to give that more detail on that as well. And really how to, you know, not only, not only just in the interview setting, but e even if you have sales in your background, even how to put people from a selling standpoint in one of those boxes when you use selling a product or service of goods. Hmm. Well, the other question, um, this is also about three things put into one. So the idea, most of the folks that are on, in our audience today, a uh, majority are women, some are, most of them are of color, um, and they uh, and want to know how do you make yourself, which I don't think is what I would do, but how do you make yourself either gender neutral, race cultural neutral, um, and does that, you know, does that really up or down your game um, versus if you play it up, and someone knows that you are a woman or you are Asian or you are whatever, does that work in your favor or does it work against you 
is there some positive or negative in neutrality? Yeah, I, I think there's two things to think about. Uh, be who you are, because who you are is outstanding. You can't change that. I mean, if you're a woman, you can, nothing you can do about that. On your resume, <laughs> you can't change it. No, nothing you do about that. Um, I'll tell you that you. When I talk about fit and culture, that that's what it gets back to. They, there, certain companies do a great job around diversity, and, and they and they'll tell you. And I, I have clients that will tell me, you know, we want a diverse slate of candidates. We want we are we're looking to put a diverse candidate in this role. Now they can't say that to you, but they can say that to us, and we go out and find what their needs are. Now, conversely, that I will tell you that most companies don't do that, and they, or they don't do a great job of finding diverse talent. So in looking for a position and looking for the right role and the right culture is make sure they embrace diversity, because uh, that's the company you want to work for anyway. Um, but also be sensitive to, I say that, but let me get back to when you talk about high tech, they really don't care. As long as you can do the job and you have the skills and the technical knowledge they're looking for, Oracle got four or 500 jobs open right now. You think they care about gender? No, they care about if you can do that job, and that's why they have to outsource it. So, you know, it's really about picking the right pony that you want to ride. There are certain companies, whether it's a Pepsi or whether it's a Coca, do a great job around diversity. Look at their board members. Look at their senior leadership. Look at their middle management, how they're moving people through their organization. If you don't see a lot that looks like you, in many cases they don't embrace that, and you're, not, you're going to hit a wall. You're going to hit a ceiling. Now, you can say to yourself, well, I can push through that, and in many cases we can because we're smart enough to do so. But you also got to think about the landscape and the art, what I call the landmines you got to deal with with certain organizations and not in other organizations. So the only exception I would say will be high tech because they really don't care because it's really supply and demand because they don't have enough people with the right skill sets to do their jobs. They really don't care about gender. They really don't care about until they get to the senior level, a gender or color, all that stuff. They really don't care. They need talent. But some of the other industries, yeah, they're very sensitive about that. So the ones that embrace it, and do your research. Find out who embrace diversity and, and embrace it and, and want to receive my difference. And so all uh, my difference is. So I think that's critically important for you to do research and find who to embrace that. But again, uh, can't change who you are. Don't change who you are. Uh, you're talented enough by yourself. Understand that's going to be an obstacle. Some people are going to see you and say, you know what, I, you know, let's look at this. I say this all At the end of the day, people hire people they like. And in many cases, they have people like them because they're comfortable with that. You know, think about it. Many, you know, we talk about this reality of myth. Most companies and most people don't want to hire somebody new because now they got to train you, they got to teach you the culture and all this other stuff. They really would like to hire within. The problem is what keeps mm -hmm. us in business because they haven't done a great job of coaching, training, developing people, or succession planning. That they can't, they don't have talent, so they got to bring a great person like you into the organization. So they would not, you know, if they had their their, their brothers, they would not like to do that. Really, they would. It's, they got to do it. They got to spend time. They got to. They, they don't want to do that. So, be who you are. Who you are is outstanding. Uh, you can sell to those different, uh, but some cultures are not going to be a good fit for you. Just understand that. And I was going to say too, to add on to that, that as neutral as you want to be. There are people like you, recruiters and others, who can just find you on social media, and they'll know who you look like and what you are, despite whatever you say on a resume. So they will figure out who you are. So I agree with you, Marlon. To and I do to look see on who social you media. Are and find the right. Huh? I do. We do. I'm, I can't. I said that before. Let me mm -hmm. tell you, we are looking. I look at when I get <laughs> to my finalists. I'm looking on Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm just googling that name. And I want to pull up everything I possibly can, criminal record, everything. So right, if you don't any, think that if you don't think that they're doing that when they're getting ready to make a big investment in you, you're fooling yourself. So if you spend the time really making sure your social media platforms are tight, that's the advice I would give you. Yeah. No, and it's the advantage for you and for the recruiter for them to be able to just know who you are. I mean, I've had the, the fortunate or unfortunate of my name seeming neutral and they're not expecting someone black, they're expecting someone white quite often and they are there shocked and it kind of sets the interview off a little differently versus if they knew that I was a black candidate. So kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, that leads to the next question. Um, how do recruiters and or in general on resumes, uh, you know, do they look for 
other profile links to your LinkedIn and websites and stuff on your resume, are those to be included? Um, or is that included more in a cover letter now? Or you know, how do you use social media and your great profiles if done properly to your advantage in this recruitment process? Yeah, it all depends on what you do. For example, um, if you are a graphic design artist, then definitely you want to use it because you want that to link to your work. Architects mm -hmm. now, whether it's web designers, et cetera. And in the new world, uh, resumes are going to be done like that. It's going to mm -hmm. take us a little while, but it's going to link us to those profiles. If you're talking about just if, if you're in the industry, a salesperson, and you're in that industry, it's not necessary, and we're mm -hmm. not looking for that. But if you need to show work, uh, then you you want to have that as a part of the link from your resume straight through. And I call that a web-based resume that I think you mm -hmm. need to have that can link you to your work. So yeah, not in all circumstances. Just like in all circumstances, you would not use you know a functional resume versus a you know chronological resume. Okay. I think that's fair. And what about you brought up before um, what to and not include what to and not to include in your resume in regards to the addresses and phone numbers. Uh, what if you are specifically planning to move, or you know you definitely want a job someplace else, maybe even internationally. So if you wanted to work in Spain, or you know how do you um, you know, do you have to, having an address in, in, in Spain, is that important? Is it, you know, how do you kind of balance that if it's close by, or like you said, East Coast to West Coast, or just going from Georgia to Florida, you know, are you better off or a better candidate if you're seen close by? Because you mentioned something about how, you know, they do look at that and what's the distance. Um, so how do yeah. you use that to your advantage, or how do you, yeah. you know, find a happy meeting? Well, if you if you're looking to go international and they know there's a S, you know, I call it expat to go along with it, then you, they're going to know. So you, you can use your U.S. address because they know they're going to relocate you to Spain or wherever. Mm -hmm. This way it gets tricky, and I'm going to share some information with you. And if you, if anyone you guys repeat I said this, I'll won't, I'll deny that I said this. <laughs> so if you're in Tampa, you need to find an address in Tampa. If you're in, and if you're trying to move to California, you need to find your address, an aunt, an uncle, etc. Now, when it gets to be local, let's say you're in the Bronx and you're trying to get to Queens, and we know that that could be, or let's say, let's let's use the Brooklyn to, to Queens, and that could be a hike sometimes, you know, train delay, etc. In many cases, you better. My advice to you, if you're trying to get a job in Queens, then use a Queens address. You're like, well, Marlon, I don't know anyone in Queens. Well, then use your local subway shop as the address. Now, I said to you that they're smart, but they're not that smart. So they do look at, well, you know, I can see this. I love this resume, but, she, you know, she's coming from Brooklyn, and, man, you know, train delay. She's going to be late. Eventually, you know, she's going to get tired of making that commute. They're, they're human. They're thinking about that. So to eliminate that, what I encourage people to do is find you a queen's address and use it. So that way when they look at it, okay, now how you get to work shouldn't be their concern. What you do to get there at 9 o'clock on Monday morning and leave Friday at 5 o'clock, that's all they need to be concerned about, how you get back and forth. They don't understand your home dynamics, okay? Now, when they see you in Brooklyn, then all of a sudden they begin to think through your home dynamics. So let's eliminate that. So whether it's a local Burger King in Queens, use that address. You think they're going to look it up? No, they're not going to look it up. They're going to look at Queens good, they're local, they're close, man, this would be a good candidate. So I didn't say that, but that's kind of a strategy that I would do. If anybody you be honest, said right? that, be honest. I'm denying. Be honest. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. Um, I use, I say, use Subway. So that's what I gotcha. would do. So honesty is the best policy, folks. Put the, put the truth out there. So the other question that obviously keeps coming up is, you know, how can the average job hunter, job seeker, career changer, change agent of this world find a recruiter, or do they have to be found by someone like you? Um, and specifically in different areas. Like, so how do, if you're in nonprofit versus if you're in corporate versus if you're in IT, like, is there a listing somewhere? Do you guys just pop up out of, you know, the sky? Is it because I have yeah, we, a super resume? I mean, how do you yeah. find me? How do I find you? 
Well, they create us in special pods, that's for sure. And so you need to understand how to find special people like myself to be able to do that. But no, I think that um, yeah, I think that's very, very important too. I, I really that's a great question. I think is very, very important, and we make a lot of mistakes. So one of the things I talk a lot about is let me very let me help you to understand this landscape just a little bit. We don't just sit by the phone and wait for you to call us because you're looking for a job. In many cases, we're already contracted to do a job. So we're working on finding candidates that we are contracted to do. So our fee structure is uh, a client has paid us money up front to begin to look for a VP of marketing. So when you call me and you have an IT background, I really can't help you because I'm working on projects that you know, pay me a fee that I can eat. I like eating. So what happens is that you call, and I guess the assumption is that I drop what I'm doing, and then I, I sort of you know, funnel your resume to a lot of different companies in order to get a hit on where I have a relationship with. And in many cases, from a process standpoint, we don't work that way, and it's hard for a lot of recruiters to work that way uh, because we don't have the time to do that. So with that said, it, it's so important to align with recruiters that do what you do in your industry and in your field. So to your point, if you take IT, then there are, there are companies out there that specialize in IT, and, and you can Google them. There's a book that comes out, a list of recruiters that have thousands of them, and they, they tell you what they specialize in, and it's very, you can Google it and you can find it. Uh, but they specialize in IT. Uh, they specialize in uh, consumer packaged goods. So if you know you want to be in the consumer packaged goods industry, there are recruiters that only do consumer packaged goods. There are recruiters that only do HR. They only do IT. So when going out and picking the right partner or recruiter for you, I call them partners, it is so important that you don't just pick a generic partner uh, that mm -hmm. is that is going to take your resume. Or what I do is I put it in a big old file, and I never look at it again until I have a potential job that can fit your need. Otherwise, I probably can't help you. I probably won't do anything with it. So take the time to find. Now, here's the thing. Don't align with everyone. You know. Find two, at, at the most, three recruiters that may be an IT recruiter or may be a sales specialist or a finance specialist uh, that may focus in your industry and, and only deal with those two or three recruiters. And we will have different clients that we deal with in different parts of the country. And, and, and that's another piece. There, there are certain recruiters that only deal in New York and the only one deal in California. So all those things you need to take into account when picking those two or three partners that you want to help you find what you're looking for, what I call your genius and your, your dream job. So uh, that alignment is so important, and that's a great question. Gotcha. Well, it seems like you've mostly answered most of the questions, or I've condensed them in enough time. Um, but you know, a lot of the questions also come up. You, know, you mentioned about diversity and trying to find you know the right fit, um, and often you know, people are looking for jobs because they haven't had the right fit. Um, so, you know, how much research should one do? Where, do, like, you know, do you actually go visit these places? Like, you know, do you volunteer for stuff? I mean, what is the, the best way? Um, and this is coming from both ends, those who have had lots of experience and have, you know, worked 20 plus years. And then those who are just interning now or have internships or fellowships, how do you also incorporate that kind of um, time spent without it being a salary time into your resume. Go, go to the, big, the first part of it again, say it again. So one part is, you know, how do you kind of look at the job market of you've not been successful at finding a fit, right? So you've had quite, not a long resume of quite of many jobs because you've been fired. You It just didn't work for you. So now how do you find that fit as someone who's been in the workforce for, who's seasoned? versus someone who's just coming into the workforce who hasn't had any scars yet <laughs> and doesn't particularly want any. Yeah, for a seasoned person, it's, it's a little more difficult because companies are not getting older, they're getting younger, uh, let's be honest. Secondly, is if for a seasoned person, one thing I always encourage them to do is maybe it's not you know Fortune 500 companies. Maybe it's those next tier companies because they're looking for seasoned employees. They're looking for someone who's done it in the big companies it can bring those skill sets and experiences to a smaller company. Maybe it's a 500, uh, $500 million company. It may, maybe it may be a billion dollar company. Maybe not even that big. But a part of it is they, they are starving for talent. They're starving for seasoned talent. 
So what I find is when there's a big gap in time for seasoned employees or potential candidates, that they're looking in the wrong places. They, they're still trying to look in the General Mills of the world and the Pepsi of the world versus mm -hmm. looking at a company like uh, Acuma that's a, uh, or a company like Ivy that, that's a $300 million company that's starving for talent that came from a Pepsi or came from uh, IBM, et cetera. They, they need that talent. They need someone who understands SAP. They need somebody who understands healthcare analytics. They need someone who understands all these different skill sets and what we've been trained to do, how to bid, do annual business reviews and those kind of things. Those smaller companies are starving for talent, and specifically, they're starving for seasoned talent. Now, the other thing is I think is great for seasoned talent, seasoned candidates, is that I tell them, listen, this is a high probability you can get an equ equity play with smaller companies like that that need your talent. So maybe you take less from a, uh, a compensation standpoint, would you get more and from a wealth standpoint, from an equity standpoint? And those components exist with smaller companies. So that would be my strategy for seasoned employees. For young people, uh, it's really about, you know, one is going back to your colleges and using those career placement centers and or if they have career portals and begin to do that. That's the first thing. Second thing, what I find in uh, the millennials particularly is they don't want to move. And so, again, if you got zero experience, you should take every opportunity. I don't care if it's in Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, you got <laughs> zero experience. So go get some experience. So then when you have experience, now you've built up, what, credibility and equity. So when you come time to move back to New York, now you say, I've been working in North Dakota for five years doing PR. I'm ready to move back to New York now. So now you say, I want to think about who you're competing against, particularly in these major markets as a young employee. You, you know, you, the job market is correcting itself, so correcting, still correcting itself. So with that in mind, you got to think about it. There are people with 10 years of experience, 15 years of experience that, that wants a PR job too that you're competing against. Now, they're too seasoned to go to North Dakota because they have family dynamics that exist. As a young person, sign up. Go. That's what I would do. So if you're in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, some of these D.C., major cities, you know, you're competing against me, and i got 15 years of experience. You know, in many cases, I'm going to get the job before you. Because you don't have to train me. I got I got to train you. So if I'm young, go for it. This is this is the opportunity to go and to any move to different parts of the country and get that experience. That's the important thing. Get experience. Get experience. Get experience. And build skills. Well, the last question I'm going to also kind of compile leads back to the whole social media piece um, of how do you how long does it take to kind of clean up and distance yourself from your Facebook past or any kind of issues or the pookies of the world um, to clean up your act? And then how, and how, do you, how can you or can you do your own background check ahead of time to see what might be on there and might, what might come up? Like, so how do you kind of look at some of the stuff that you're looking at or you have access to ahead of time to kind of beat the recruiter and beat the company to the punch? So let me ask, answer the second question first. Uh, yes, you can do your own background check. Uh, there are companies, whether it's Equifax, et cetera, that will do that for you. Uh, there are companies, or even smaller companies, that will do a background that you, they charge a fee to do that, uh, uh, do it for you. Now, the, 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 honestly, the cheap way is to give one of your best friends a resume and have them to call into the company and say, well, you know, did Marlon work here, and what did he do? Who did he report into? What's the time frame? He now some companies will give you that, some companies won't. Mm -hmm. You know, by law, they're only supposed to say that Marlon worked there from 2009 to mm -hmm. 2013. That's by law. That's the only information they're supposed to give. But we know how that works out. Um, so you know, the cheap way is to get a friend to do it for you. But there are companies that are out there, like Equifax, that will do a background check for you for a fee and check everything that's in your background. Uh, it, you know, unfortunately about social media, once it's out there, it's out there. So how can you change it? It's not a short process. It's not a long process because once it's out there, it's out there. And what happens is in the cycle of social media, it all depends on when it pulls up. So mm -hmm. if it's not hitting the top of the media chain versus it be, you know, I have to really search to find it. Okay, so again, you, it really never goes away when it's in the clouds, really. You can try to push it down and move it and have other things that try to compete and try to clean it up, but you it really never get clean. I don't know if you know that because it's out in the clouds. So what you try to do is try to suppress it and try to, bring, try to give other things 
in your background to be at a higher precedent. So when I pull it up, I'll pull the most recent positive thing versus the thing that was negative to make sure. Because again, I, I only have so much time. So I'm going to go deep, but I'm not going to go that deep. So just don't let it be glaring. So put some positive things that you will need to be on your Facebook, et cetera. But start to disconnect from Pookies and Bebe's and all those. Start to remove those people from your social media platform as soon as you can. Um, so what some people are doing is having two different sites. If you want to go through the trouble of doing that, that's on you. But again, I'm going to pull up your name, and I'm going to pull up everything that's associated with your name. And whatever that pulls up is what I'm going to see. So from a strategic standpoint, but I mean we should do that anyway. Start to put positive things in our background that's going to be on social media anyway. You know, for example, I, I guarantee you if I ask all of you, how many of you uh, put on your Facebook page as a part of this uh, digital this webinar today? I, I, I would bet you 75% of you didn't put that. It said, I checked in I'm, and posted on your Facebook. As a potential employer and as a recruiter, those are the things I want to see. So that all you're trying to do that right now, aren't you? I know you are. <laughs> so, so, but I guarantee you, 75% of you didn't do that, and it never fails. We don't do that, and so you need to make social media a, a way of life because in a new world, it's going to be a way of life. And when I pull it up, I want to pull up all the positive. Oh, I can see that Jody was a part of this webinar today. Great, you're doing something, and those are the things I want to see. So just put more positive on this. All the negative stuff goes down to the bottom. And things that have been positive, just just kind of reintroduce them, and then they'll be positive again more recently. Yeah, well, Marlon, I definitely want to thank you for ending my uh, the season for the Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series on a successful note today. I think everyone got a lot out of here. I think we had about 100 listeners today in our audience, um, which is always great. And as Marlon alluded to, you can see all of the uh, social media platforms that he and I are both a part of in addition to using the hashtag Urban League UL Success. Um, I hope some of you will be joining us in Fort Lauderdale. Marlon will be hosting and uh, the facilitator moderator for our executive panel, speaking live and in person to those who are on the executive level, those of you who are already there and those of you who are trying to get there, the inside track, um, and specifically in tech jobs. It will be part of our Tech Connect Day in the Career uh, Fair in Fort Lauderdale. So if you're not joining us, though, please remember to please put your resume into the Jobs Network. Um, all of our participating uh, sponsors and companies, corporations, will have an opportunity to still look at your resume, and hopefully you'll make some of the tweaks that Marlon spoke about today um, to your resume, to your Facebook pages, to your LinkedIn profile. And Marlon, do you have any last words of uh, advice to our listeners today as, you know, if you were speaking to your younger self, not that you're old, but if you were speaking to your Thank younger you. self uh, in your career path, just, something you could have done? No, just if you are changing jobs, if you're looking for a job, work it as a job, as a nine to five treacherous kind of arduous type of process and that's how you should treat it if you do that you'll be fine yes and those of you who are only joined us today or have joined us throughout the entire process for the last few years um, a lot of our previous uh, presentations are still found online and you can listen to those and we will be sending out a survey today as to feedback on how this went and also we'll send you a link to the um, presentation so you can review it yourself and keep yourself on track. We wish you only the best in career success and hope to see as many of you as possible in Fort Lauderdale. Until then, have a great day.